If I was to think about the last five years and if I was to review it, personally, I think I wouldn't do anything differently. You know, I, th I think I kind of came into this way of living with a, this kind of, you know, this real reliance on, on, on money for, for everything. You know, if you have more money, you're, you're safe, you're secure, you know. You, and, and actually, since being here, what I'm starting to learn and transition into is actually security is wood in the woodshed. Security is food in the kitchen garden. You know, security is healthy land around us. Security is, is a good, is a, is a healthy community around me. And I think it's, it's a process I think personally I'm still really working through, but I'm starting to really genuinely feel that transition into what is a value to me is not something that I hold in my hand in coins or paper notes. It's actually, you know, what's in my heart, what's uh, what, 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 what the air that I breathe, the water that I drink and the food that I eat. And that's a really lovely transition to make. My name is uh, Lynn and this is my partner Sandra and we are uh, living at Limbrek Croft which is a, a small agricultural holding of about 150 acres and we are in the Cairngorms National Park in the Highlands of Scotland and we've got the beautiful Cairngorm Mountains behind us here. So I always describe Limbrek as being somewhere that's kind of quintessentially Scottish. So you have all of kind of the elements of Scotland in one here so we have a mixture of lovely pasture fields, we have heathery hill ground, uh, we have some nice native Scottish woodland and then we have a big, big piece of Scottish bog. So it's a little bit of Scotland uh, in a little corner of the Cairngorms. We noticed quite soon after meeting uh, that we shared this dream of, of living closer to the land and at the time we were working in the southeast of England as rangers um, so it was kind of two contrasting kind of ways of living and one was being out in the natural environment working outside most of the time and the other was being in a quite a, a busy part of the country uh, quite heavily populated um, and we just knew that one day we, we wanted to have our own bit of land where we could grow our own food where we could just kind of step away from the rat race as well and we recognised it was probably going to be Scotland because that's where my family's from and I've just always felt that natural draw and uh, well the, the search started then really for, for the ideal bit of land which was always going to be a, a few acres uh, we just thought you know just enough for a few hens and the veg garden and well ended up with 150 and everything changed. We came here on a day like today and Limbrek was kind of showcasing itself in all its glory and it was really difficult to not fall in love with somewhere like this. Um, we, we didn't have the money at the time, uh, we had absolutely zero intention of going into farming but it was one of those decisions that you very much make with your heart um, and your head just has to catch up and that's the situation we found it, ourselves in. The first few months here were actually it's a really interesting time to reflect on because on the one hand you're going look at us we've done it you know we've kind of followed our dreams we said we were going to do it and we're doing it and then on the other hand you're going I have no idea what I'm doing and so we spent quite a few days you know those early days just sort of wandering around desperately trying to find what our purpose was here on this land and you know we'd have days where we'd have the highest highs followed by the lowest lows so it was a real period of transition and one that we had to just allow to develop organically. I suppose as well is that originally we were, we were not going to be farmers and we realised very quickly, obviously, when we bought the place, you have to scale up when you've got 150 acres and we wanted to do something with the land. We didn't just want to set it aside. We wanted mm. to produce food for, for ourselves but then we realised with 150 acres you can produce food for your community as well and that aspect was really important to us is to be able to reach out to the area around us and provide really good food but if you've not got a farming background wh where do you start that was the big question and so that was on top of everything else we had that to kind of contend with as well um, how, how do you start a business from scratch and how do you start a farm basically from scratch when you don't have the infrastructure or the money. 
I think when we realised that we were going to have to kind of become farmers, um, the that we were going to have to, but also wanted to. I think that's, that's a really important point to make. We, we wanted to become farmers when we saw what the potential of the land was. Um, you know, the realistic point is, is that we had to find money from somewhere because we didn't have any. That's the thing. I mean, we actually had a debt to pay off. So um, we just started looking in the most obvious place, which is trawling through grant funding, you know, in, in, in the UK and in Scotland, you know, the, the government offers different sort of streams of funding that, you, you know, you can access. And I guess we got into it at the right time. So uh, we were able to see what was available uh, and then write a business plan. So we had just a few months to do that. And we wrote a five year business plan based on no ex real experience and no knowledge, just trying to kind of get something from everywhere, wrote a business plan, submitted for a, a, an initial grant, got the grant, and that basically started the ball rolling. And that's the kind of path that we've gone on from there on. So I, I would say that our vision here at Limbrek is, is to create a small farming business that completely works in harmony with nature. We want to farm in a way that um, enhances nature. Uh, we want to work with the land. We want to work with natural processes. And we don't just want to say the words. We don't want to use the kind of the buzz lingo. We actually want to do it. And and I would say that as part of our work is is to actually redefine what nature means. You know, so it's really interesting if you look in the in in the, in the dictionary, the word nature does not include the word people. So we've effectively defined ourselves out of nature, and we want to farm in a way that defines people back into nature in a way in which we're part of a holistic system where we give and we take we don't continually extract and and we offer the work that we do as a way of showcasing what's possible and a way of reconnecting people with the land you know reconnecting people with places like this the food that you know that they buy uh the very kind of land that they walk on i, I would say that's our ultimate big picture vision for limbrek we live in a very exposed location um, we live in a, in a place where it gets hot weather. Trees give us shade, they give us shelter, uh, they give us additional feed for our animals, they give us incredible habitat for the nature that we, you know, the, the wildlife that we share Limbrek with. And I think, you know, we all accept um, that the climate is changing. That, that's, that's simply fact. And what we're facing are more extremes. So more extreme winds, uh, more extreme temperatures. And one of the best ways that we can prepare ourselves and our land holding and our future animals for is more trees. I guess trees are so important to us that we've, we've really focused on planting here at Limbrek. So uh, we've planted just under 30,000 trees here uh, within the last five years. And we've set aside over half the croft to woodland. So that's either new woodland planting. So we've planted a forest of 17 and a half thousand trees on our hill ground. We've allowed 18 acres uh, to just naturally regenerate itself. Uh, we've planted over a kilometre and a half of hedgerows. Um, and we've planted copses of trees that will provide shade and shelter, but will actually provide a source of food for our animals. So really we're kind of trying to find as many ways as possible to integrate trees into our landscape and we've got more to come. The, there will be more trees. There I will be more trees. The next trees are the, going to be the kind that will private, provide us with food. Um, so far we've done a lot of native tree planting and that's for the environment and for our animals and obviously we benefit through that as well um, but we'd like to see some agroforestry happening in the form of fruit and nut trees in the fields uh, so that's a future project to look out for. Vegetables were the very first thing we focused on when we came to the Croft. We arrived here um, in March, which is quite a sort of a bleak time up here. Everything's quite washed out. Winter's often still got its its grip um, on the Croft. Brown. Everything's brown. <laughs> Everything's but brown. we thought we want to grow our own food. So uh, we, we put in a, um, a kitchen garden, five raised beds, um, put up a bit of shelter and then just started to grow things uh, just hoping they would want to live and uh, it all took off and it turns out at 350 meters above sea level um, facing the Cairngorms which has got a, an arctic plateau and gets some fierce weather coming across it you can actually grow a lot of food who would have thought
<laughs> so we now grow about 70% of our sort of annual vegetables um, outside uh, and now a lot more in our polycrub as well. So we chose the animals that we work with on the croft quite carefully. Uh, we wanted something that was going to be fairly low input, that wasn't going to need loads of input and work to just keep it alive in a fairly challenging climate. So the obvious thing to start with um, were, were cows, cattle, for the, the, the work that they can do for the environment and to get our pastures into kind of a, a more species rich state again after not having been grazed for several decades. So we chose highland cattle because they are the obvious choice for this kind of climate. Um, they're native, they're very hardy, they, they thrive on fairly poor vegetation which we do have as well in, in rough grazings and our bog. Um, and they can, they can cope with being outside in winter too, throughout blizzards and everything. They're great to work with. We, we, we graze them in a way that allows the, the, the pasture a lot of rest. So we, we move them every day throughout the growing season, which means they get the freshest of grass every single day and the grass gets loads of rest afterwards. And we've seen you know, loads and loads of improvement in species diversity. We're starting to build soil mm -hmm. and we have a lovely product to sell afterwards in the form of, you know, pasture fed beef, highland beef. We wanted loads and loads of cow poo. We need cow poo. Cow poo is, cow poo is gold and it, it, it helps to improve the fertility of the soil, which helps the grassland, to, you know, to sequester more carbon right in there. So it's all about, you know, as the kind of famous American um, farmer, Joel Salatin would say, it's all about the animalness of the animal. It's working with the animals of the animal. We try and do that with our cows, uh, same with our pigs. So, you know, this is a landscape that would have had, you know, thousands of years ago would have had, you know, a, a very different kind of range of species wandering around. So you would have had your, you know, your large herbivores, like your aurochs, who would have been here, that they're, they're like our highland cows now. You'd also have had wild boar that would have kind of been rootling and tootling through the landscape. So we work with our pigs to be like wild boar. So their, their function, their role here is to kind of just be pigs. So they, they, they get their snouts in the ground, they break up the kind of dense mat of veg vegetation. And by exposing that little bit of bare soil, it allows two things to happen. So either new seeds that are in the seed bank already give a chance to pop up and grow, or uh, a tree seedling could fall into that bare patch of soil and, and set and grow. So we use our pigs in, in different places, in woodlands, we've used them in grasslands, we, we use them on our bog, we use them in our rough grazings. And it's basically utilising what is their superpower for nature and helping us to build biodiversity back into the croft. What we get out of that is obviously the joy of working with these incredible animals. We get this phenomenal produce to sell. It's the kind of produce that I say, you know, almost money can't buy, although it can. It's, it's from pigs that are, that are grazing natural forage. They do get a, a, an, an organic feed alongside that. But you know, they're grazing grasses, they're grazing rushes, they're active, they're fit, they're healthy, they're, they're lean. You know, they're lean mean snuffling machines. They're incredible animals. So we work with the pigness of the pig in that situation. And then we've got this crew behind us, you know, our, our, our motley crew of, of ladies who lay. They're the hens, they're the hens, that they're the wild birds uh, who follow the, 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 the kind of the large herbivores in the landscape. So they, they kind of go through the, the fields, they scatter cow pats, helping to break that down. Uh, they eat the grubs, they eat, they eat the fly larvae, um, they scratch out the moss, uh, they add their own fertility, you know, uh, hen poo is, 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 is incredible for the soil. Um, and then we move them on. So again, like the cows, like the pigs, everything's always moving because in nature, nothing stays static. And that includes the animals that, and the insects that live a part of it. So ours do the same. And they provide us with these incredible little little bombs of, of you know, eggy goodness uh, that, that just sell and sell and sell. We wanted bees because it's obvious they're pollinators and uh, they've, they've got a wonderful role to play in the natural environment. So getting into beekeeping has been a wonderful learning curve. There's so much to, to learn about these creatures and the role they play and just their, their, their life cycle as well. It all happens in a hive, very hidden away. So until we started the, kind of handling them more, we, we had no clue what, what really goes on. 
and of course they produce honey as well. We have up to 10 hives, it can kind of vary um, throughout the season. But we've also learned that as well as having our bees as pollinators, we need to um, appreciate the role that all the native pollinators that were already here before that they play uh, because they get on with it without our help. We, we don't farm them. So we've actually capped the number of hives of our honeybees to, to give the native pollinators a chance as well. You know, we go through a, a kind of a, hung, a so-called hunger gap in, in June when there's not a lot of forage around for them. And we think if, if our bees are struggling, native pollinators might be struggling too. So we don't want our bees to take away any of the, the forage. So we're finding a balance there with our bees and, and, and all the other life around us. So we moved to Limbrecht and we knew nobody. Um, you know, my family are in Ireland, Sandra's family are in Switzerland. You know, we've got a few other kind of bits and family, you know, dotted around the UK, but we knew nobody in this area. So uh, obviously we're moving up here for a way of life, but we're also now moving up here because we're starting to run a new business. So how do you, how do you kind of start to create those foundations? And really, um, I guess initially it was just, you know, we got out and met the neighbours, you know, neighbours in that direction, neighbours in that direction, got to know people locally that way. Um, whenever we moved here initially, we both worked part time. So again, that helped to build connections. Uh, and then it was getting into social media. So creating a Facebook page, creating an Instagram page, then creating a website, getting a mailing list. And it was just really kind of slowly, slowly building it up. The first produce that we had to sell was in fairly low quantities, which was, which was ideal really on reflection because it was like a, a way of just kind of getting a little bit out there. It gave us a confidence boost because we managed to sell it all. And that's basically what we've built on from there on. So in terms of farm tours, I, I always say, you know, we have nothing to hide here. You know, so what, what we say we do is, is what we actually do. And I think um, offering your kind of land up to actually showcase that is a really, really positive thing to do because it turns those words, it turns those images that you see you know, on a screen into actual real life. So you can stand in front of the hens and say, you know, look, look, at, look, at, look at the way these hens live and the kind of eggs they produce. You know, we take them down to the pigs and you know, everybody loves the pigs. The pigs are all you know, full of joie de vivre. And then you say, would you eat them? Do you want to eat them? You know, we have these really hard hitting conversations but equally, I think I always get the impression that people leave the farm tours feeling really positive. And that's ultimately what we want them to go away feeling. We want them to feel like this is a nice way to produce food. Like this is a nice way to live. And it's not just a nice idea. It's actually a nice reality. And that it's not just about us doing it. It's a collective effort. So, you know, we can, we, can stand, we can sit here and talk all we want about what we do. If people didn't buy our produce, we wouldn't be able to do that. So as much as, you know, somebody in a city or somewhere else might not feel connected to this, the power that you have through the produce that you purchase is massive. So opening up your farm to place is, is such a positive, positive experience if you're truthful and honest. I think that animals are an integral part of every ecosystem. You know, somebody, I can't remember who it was, but somebody once said there's no such thing as a vegetarian ecosystem. And that's what we're working with. And I think, I think where we've maybe kind of gone off track is our relationship with the animals that, that we live and work alongside with and how we treat them and how that impacts on the environment. I think that's what we need to be looking at. At the end of the day, you know, what are we? You know, we, we, are, we are omnivores. You know, we have, um, we have had a mixed diet for millennia of, of scavenging, of, you know, of eating meat, of eating, you know, fruits, of eating all sorts of things. Um, I, don't have a, I don't think that that is fundamentally wrong, but I think how we do it now to how we did it a long time ago is probably where the problems have come in. But for a regenerative future, animals are, are key. Well, and, and seeing as well as when you're doing regenerative farming or just living regeneratively in, in general, you, you're, you're sort of copying a natural system. Mm -hmm. And the natural system very much 
only functions because it's all based on a cycle of life and death. Yep. Things have to die for other things to be alive. And whether that's vegetation or, or animals or fungi, we all have to live off of something. And so it's to, to see ourselves and everything around us as part of that cycle. Um, which very much involves animals and, and plants. And uh, what you want to do is make sure that everything that you impact on is impacted on as positively as possible and that you, you, you pay it the respect it deserves. We're at the end of the first five year plan and where it looks now versus where it was supposed to look is very, very different. It, in some ways it's very similar, but the, the, the detail has changed a lot. Um, the next five years, I think, will look very different again. So we now um, we now have a new business. Um, we have customers. Uh, you know, we have regular produce for sale. I think the next five years is going to have two main strands of focus. Um, one is is more kind of outreach and education. So we really enjoy. We love having people here. You know, we love talking about what we do. Uh, we love we love we love being challenged on what we do you know stimulating that really good deba debate and sharing our knowledge that's something that we just really enjoy doing so there's that one side i think uh, the other side is actually going to be focusing more on on our life here so spending more time in the kitchen garden spending more time in the polycrub uh, spending more time having day trips you know I guess think t taking time out for ourselves to enjoy Limbrek for what it is, but actually also have some time out as well. Uh, and, and I would say all of that is parceled up into the general kind of route that we're on, which is continuing to feed people in our community, you know, getting our meat produce out, getting our eggs out, you know, every week going and chatting to our customers. Um, you know, that, that for me is what the future of Limbrek looks like. When, when we worked as rangers, we, we, we kind of acquired a basic understanding and knowledge of ecology um, and how the natural systems work and just identifying things. And so that, that kind of sparked an interest, definitely. When it comes to farming and combining the two, we kind of jumped in at the deep end a little bit because we bought the place and it, in a way it happened fairly quickly. And there wasn't that much time to start preparing ourselves. Um, so we did a lot of it when we were here. We, we, we did read a lot of books, you know, watch things, watch films and try to kind of be like sponges and soak up as much as possible. But I would say just as much as that, we've actually just learned by doing. You can read so much and then you just have to go out and you have to give it a go. And then you have to observe and see, did that work? If it didn't, why not? And what changes are there now? And try and understand why these things happen and it, it takes time but I think yeah a lot of it is just learning by doing which is a scary thought when you don't really have much experience but you come out of it after a year and you look back and you think wow all those firsts they'll, they'll never be firsts again we, we did them all and well we learned various things from them and it's it's quite empowering that way. So if there's somebody looking to get into regenerative farming in the UK. I think the opportunities that there are now are so much greater than what there were five years ago. I mean, what we've seen develop in the last five years is just bonkers. You know, when we started looking five years ago, there was one place in Scotland that we found. Now, you know, there's gotta be at least a hundred or more. So we wanted to kind of contribute to that kind of growing movement. So we've, we've written our own uh, course here. So we, it's called How to Farm. It's inspired by the book called You Can Farm by Joel Salatin, who's a big kind of influencer in what we do. And it was basically the course that we wish had existed five years ago when we were starting out. So it covers everything from, you know, what kind of quality of life do you want? Uh, that's something that we often forget about because we think, how much money am I going to earn? Actually, what kind of quality of life do you really want? And then it starts to get into the nitty gritty of it. So it gets into things like our cattle system, our pig system, our hens. You know, we've got spreadsheets. How much does it cost? What's your setup costs? We look at beekeeping. We look at butchering. We look at all the finance elements. But we, we still parcel all of that up into the overwhel over, over, overarching umbrella of what kind of life do you want? And so we're really excited to be running those courses um, this year. And then next year, we're planning to continue those courses, but also a lot offer 
offer a lot of kind of half day courses on, on different regenerative principles on each of the things that we do. So to me, uh, regenerative agriculture is, is a way of producing food by regenerating everything around you as you go. So it's a way of you know, working with animals to, to, to build soil organic matter to produce an incredible quality beef. It's using pigs to restore native woodlands uh, to then produce this incredible rare breed pork. It's using hens on pasture to create new diversity and you're producing eggs as you go. It's all about continually giving back um, all the time with everything that you do. And I think we have to be realistic in that, you know, we are, we, this is a very busy planet and what we're doing as humans is impacting on it in all sorts of ways. And I think if we're, if we're going to kind of continue on living in the planet, how we like it, uh, we need to address how we produce our food because that's going to be a fundamental factor as to how much longer we're going to be around for. I think you know there's that saying about leaving the land in a better state than when you found it and obviously the term better is quite quite loose but um, if we see it maybe if we say resilient uh, more resilient because the land itself resilient in the terms of it can look after itself it's it's got a balance again and um, we're producing food as part of that balance and we're not we're not tipping it in any which way so there's that resilience to 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 the land there's a resilience to your own life you know mm. also deciding how much do i actually need to 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 be content to be happy and part of all of this uh resilience in your your local food system you know supply chains should be getting much much shorter than what they are if you can play a part of that and set up a system to, to get that going um, that that's that's huge as well so i think regenerative also means resilient i think that every decision that we've made we've made with our gut and with our hearts um, but equally we've learned that we have to run a business with that it's okay to make mistakes yeah. and it's it's okay to change things when you realize it doesn't work like that for us we, we need to we need to do it differently definitely and you know we have done things where we've sort of stuck to our guns for as long as possible thinking well we'll, we'll work through it and then our gut stink and said just just let it drop speaking for myself it's it's um, made myself a lot less perfectionist i used to love having things exactly the way i wanted it and since working with as part of a natural system where you can't and you, you shouldn't be wanting to control everything all mm -hmm. the time. It's really taught me to just stand back and just let things happen. They might not always happen the way I imagined it. And actually it's made me really appreciate the unpredictability of things and just standing back and, and not getting too wound up about it. And it, it helps you kind of ground yourself and feel part of it a lot more.